Ladies and gentlemen, let us continue the evening session of uh, the Seimas. Ramdos Bubnis is uh, appointed for the director of the Resistance Center. The decision is uh, adopted with the majority of votes. I congratulate the new director. I thank their colleagues. Now we finish the first part of our session. And now let's begin the evening session. Uh, please register. Seventy-five members of the SEMAS have been registered. Please uh, don't make your remarks uh, because we will discuss and continue our, uh, continue our meeting after the discussion. Since 2 p.m., we have a discussion with uh, many speakers who are waiting to be given the floor. Dear colleagues, um, we are moving to the agenda 2.1, uh, the discussion on the situation of the human rights situation in the People's Republic of China. Uh, I would like to ask you once again, Mr. Patras Grajulis. Well, we discussed uh, Russia before uh, before the the lunch, and now we discuss China. I have to go away. I welcome you to the discussion on the human rights situation in China. The human rights and the basic and fundamental rights are annihilated to the people. They are annihilated from the individual. They are not related to any territory or the person. Human rights are inherent to every person in respect of laws and legislation of a particular country. The ruling majority in this legislative term attaches great importance to the issues of human rights, uh, be it in Venezuela, Myanmar, or even China. In the end of last year, the European Union signed a deal with China and stressed uh, the situation of human rights. I would like to recall Václav Havel by saying that uh, living in a, in a lie is recognized in humans' participation and support to any inhuman ideology. He says that, uh, that uh, re uh, failing to say the truth is also a lie. I would like to start our discussion with these words and give the floor to our guest speakers. Today we have here with us uh, our guest experts um, who will join us online. And I would like to give the floor to the first uh, speaker, Ms. Rehan Asan. She is a Uyghur human rights attorney, a graduate of Harvard Law School, uh, who specializes in international human rights law and complies with best business practices. Uh, Madam Asad, the floor is yours. Madam Chair and distinguished members of the parliament, when I was notified of the schedule of this hearing, I asked not to go first. 
But Zegis, as a true leader himself, um, said, in Lithuania, we believe women should lead. You must go first. Speaking of no pressure at all. I appear before you today as a sister, attorney, and human rights advocate. It's incredibly difficult to find myself at this hearing because I'm directly impacted by the devastating human rights crisis in Xinjiang. I would like to share these pictures. These are Uyghur men that I would like you to keep them in, their, in your thoughts and in your minds as I continue my presentation. These are transfer of detainees. This campaign started first with men, later turned to the entire population of the Uyghur community. I appear before you. Secondly, as someone who grew up in China, who once loved the country as my own while mindful of its deep flaws, there was a time when I believed that Chinese government stood for diversity and pluralism. My brother Akbar said, believe it too, and lived it for everybody else to see. In fact, the young gentleman that who you see behind me is my brother. He proudly represented China, his home, wherever he went in the world. As an Uyghur face of Chinese humanism and innovation, for a time, he was the very embodiment of the bright future he envisioned. But his dream turned out to be just that, and his hopeful future was cut short. Since spring of 2016, after he returned from representing China yet again in a prestigious U.S. department program, Akbar had been removed from the world, languishing and declining in the Chinese government's concentration camps. This very program has turned out many world leaders, including Lithuania's beloved prime minister, Dalia graibaus kaite who has shaped both Lithuania and EU's economic policy. Because of my very complicated relationship with China, it's painful to speak against it, let alone the constant fear of putting my brother's life at further peril. But I must speak up on behalf of my brother, who after three years of enduring the so-called re-education camp was transferred to torture by solitary confinement in January, 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please remind you that we're talking about almost two years. This is not just my own personal tragedy. At least one million people have been put into camps and still more illegally imprisoned in militarized jails, factories, and residential schools. Every Uyghur family is suffering the exact the same thing. Their crimes against humanity on a scale that often witness, not often witness. I know that such atrocities can somehow seem the hardest to care about. Not only the victims are dehumanized, so too are bystanders who come to feel that they must abandon empathy, compassion, and courage in the face of what seems like terrifying futility. But I implore all of you to remember that empathy, compassion, and courage are not the illusion futility is. The world can stop this atrocity before more dire measures are taken by the Chinese state, but time is running out. Since 2016, the Chinese Communist Party, under its paranoid current leadership, has built the largest system of mass ethnic detention since World War II. Often we find historical comparisons to make sense of senseless and absurd situation. And the treatment suffered by prisoners. We may compare the camps and prisons of Xinjiang to the gulags of the Soviet era. What makes them different is that the Chinese government is singling out Uyghurs and other indigenous ethnic groups as in nearly the sole victim of these gulags. The Chinese Communist Party's own term, concentrated education, reminds us what we already know. Before being turned into statistics, most of the victims of this brutal system were ordinary people. Dozens were renowned intellectuals or celebrities, many were nursing mothers, some are even minors. 
before moving on to the entire population, as I said earlier, by showing the pictures of these men. This draconian campaign began with targeting Uyghur and other Turkic men of particular age group, including successful and prominent individuals like my own brother, Ekber. Ekber is a tech entrepreneur, philanthropist, and media founder. In the Chinese government's own words, he's a positive force and a bright star in the tech world. Today, even model citizens like him have been labeled as separatists or extremists and thrown into China's modern gulag. It's no secret that their true crime was daring to have been born Uyghur. During the State Department's sponsored trip, weeks before his forced disappearance, Ekber and I met in Washington, D.C. When I asked him whether he would consider a career abroad, he said no. He expressed faith in the ultimate integrity of the Chinese government, remarking that China was making significant progress, which would also benefit ethnic minorities. Look, he remarked with pride, I'm here in Washington, D.C., representing China on the world stage. Little did Ekber know how China rewards those who work the hardest for it. History informs us, authoritarian governments often target the brightest and finest of the society to bring about a destruction of that particular culture or a group of people. This campaign of cultural destruction is being waged against the landscape of the Uyghur homeland and the minds of its people. Ancient Uyghur cultural sites, including cemeteries are being raised, modern Uyghur language identity beliefs are being destroyed through torture, forced indoctrination, and total surveillance. Five years into the crisis, the Chinese government unfortunately has not shown any sign of ceasing its oppression. But it was forced to admit what is the whole world saw, colossal global complexes China scrambled to make its actions legal. Prisoners are now receiving formal prison sentence for five, 15, or 20 years with trumped up charges, sometimes even life for such crimes as having WhatsApp downloaded, refusing to drink alcohol, or having relatives who have been to a foreign country. Once trapped in China's gulag, Uyghurs are often shipped on demands to companies across China, where they are used as forced labor in factories. This is a modern form of slavery, and it's allowing China to turn a profit while it imprisons and terrorizes an entire people. Fashion companies and technology manufacturers are strongly implicated. Hugo Boss and Volkswagen, both infamous for their use of Jewish slaves during World War II, are back to their old tricks, proudly announcing their commitment to production in Xinjiang. The clothes you're wearing could very well be made from cotton picked by Uyghurs, stitched by Uyghurs, and sold to fund their imprisonment and inhumane re-education. Perhaps about all else, this campaign is a war against the Uyghur family. Uyghur women inside and outside the camps are forcibly sterilized and can be imprisoned for having many children. Men are taken away, leaving families fatherless and often without breadwinners. At least a half million children have been separated from their guardians. They're now raised behind the barbed wire in state orphanage schools, even while their parents are still alive. Inside, they're forced to abandon their language, culture, and identity. The party's stated goal in Xinjiang, and if I may quote the Chinese government official, break their lineage, break their roots, break their connections, and break their origin. They are us, it's me, and the breaking of our connections has been my living nightmare for the past five years. Sorry, many world leaders and countries remain silent because of the Chinese government's economic might and coercion, while others, including Muslim and Turkic nations have actually endorsed China's policies. I commend therefore Lithuania and its leaders like Jobel for speaking truth to power, and I hope the Lithuanian public will follow your exemplary leadership 
to be the voice for the voiceless victims like Akbar. It's the kind of simple honesty which has driven Chinese government to launch a monumental disinformation campaign to deny our suffering. I invoke the history of the Gulag since there are similarities in arbitrary mass detention and persecution of thought crimes and forced labor. But the atrocities in my homeland are in many ways unprecedented and unique to the conditions of our time. The Chinese state has turned Xinjiang into an open air prison in which literally every single indigenous person not in the camps and jail is still monitored at all times. The region's ubiquitous security cameras are programmed to automatically recognize the Uyghur facial features. So here I'm going to ask you to keep in mind the sophisticated technology that deployed in this campaign. And I haven't yet begun to talk about the humiliation that is taking place in these camps. The humiliation is the point because dehumanization is the goal. China has repeatedly linked its mass internment of Uyghurs to eradicating tumors to the Communist Party of China. We are a cancer, a disease, and the party will not stop until we believe this about ourselves. I urge you to reflect on where things go from here. So today, I ask you to stand up for human freedom and dignity with following recommendation. I ask you to adopt my brother Akbar as a global citizen of Lithuania and be a champion for his freedom. Consider continuously imposing sanctions on those responsible for the Xinjiang police state, high-ranking officials, a corporate accomplices, secondary organs, especially those linked to Aksu prison where Akbar is being held and subject to torture. Consider issuing a visa ban on family members of those perpetrators to impose costs for their grave human rights abuses and join like-minded nations to convince the world especially rising democracies and other countries who are dependent on China not to cave in to economic pressure and to condemn China at the UN Human Rights Council and other relevant forums. Thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you, Asad, for um, sharing your experience with us and for your presentation today. I thank the first speaker and our second guest speaker is Mr. Reinhard Butikofer, a member of the European Parliament representing um, and uh, chairing uh, a delegation for relations with the People's Republic of China. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, colleagues, for the invitation and the opportunity that you are presenting to me to participate in this very important conversation. Um, I'm deeply moved by what we just heard, and I would indeed say that the human rights situation in the People's Republic of China is today more atrocious than it has ever been since the very dark days of the Tiananmen massacre. Xiang, a regime has been erected that some call a regime of genocide where while Human Rights Watch just recently published a report in which they accused the People's Republic of China of committing crimes against humanity. It's the worst police state imaginable. It's a tech totalitarian regime never seen before. And even CCP functionaries that originally were not willing to go along with that policy of oppression fell victim themselves to the ruthlessness of this regime. So Xinjiang clearly stands out as the most atrocious 
of the sins against human rights. But unfortunately, it doesn't stand alone. We have the reports and we've long had the reports from Tibet. We have more recent reports from Mongolia. While Inner Mongolia had been very much at peace without much political conflict, the imposition of a new regime of uh, language policy transformed what used to be considered a model, so-called model minority into a rebellious people that were then uh, um, put down by very heavy measures. We see that human rights are being violated at an ever on an ever increasing scale in Hong Kong, where all the uh, liberties that had been guaranteed under Hong Kong's national security, uh, Hong Kong's basic law, are overturned under the national security law, also in contradiction to international obligations that China has signed on to, like the um, um, ICCPR or the um, Sino-British Joint Declaration. And we have not to forget also the dire situation of human rights defenders in all of China, um, where lawyers who've been willing to take on human rights cases have been made defendants and put in jail themselves, where women that can be only accused of the crime, quote unquote, of of trying to work together to oppose groping in public places are being jailed, where people that just speak their mind or criticize the government are being jailed. But what I think we should also take note of is CCP leaders are not any more content with just oppressing their own people by denying them human rights, uh, which are their universal rights. CCP leaders are exporting their battle against human rights. In international fora, they're trying to impose their own definition of what human rights should mean in the future, and they peddle notions that deny individuals any claim to individual protection under human rights. But they go even beyond that. They are exporting their um, efforts in a very practical way. They are beginning to pursue policies that aim for policing what is allowed to be said about China, to be discussed about China, to be criticized of China around the whole globe. China is preventing access to websites of uh, think tanks, uh, that are critical of certain Chinese. China is um, sanctioning think tanks and researchers like uh, Merix from Germany, a, a big China think tank, or Björn Jarden, uh, a Swedish researcher, or Adrian Zenz, who has done so much to um, promote the truth about the real situation in Xinjiang. Uh, they're trying to sanction uh, these uh, brave uh, researchers. Uh, China is trying to regulate free speech globally and deny it to all global citizens. And they have even put that into the law uh, because under the national security law of Hong Kong, every individual, regardless of which country's citizens they are, could be prosecuted under Hong Kong law now if they criticize Hong Kong in a way 
that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't like. And they have also ex tried to export their battle against human rights by putting sanctions on members of parliament. And I want to pay tribute to your courageous colleague, Dovile, who has been sanctioned together with a parliamentarian from Belgium and a parliamentarian from the Netherlands and five members of the European Parliament also. Against the backdrop of these described realities, it is really um, hard to understand why European leaders thought this might be the right time to conclude an investment deal, uh, which they did uh, on the penultimate day of last year uh, by uh, finalizing the negotiations over the so-called comprehensive agreement on investment, thereby handing a geopolitical victory to Xi Jinping. When we look at the substance, of the agreement, and I will not go to a detailed analysis, I, I can promise, but we also see that the lack of attention to human rights concerns stands out, and this is completely unacceptable. Most obviously, this is the case because China has not been forced by the EU to even pledge to ratify pertinent ILO core conventions against forced labor as it is being imposed in particular on Uyghurs in Xinjiang and beyond. And Chinese diplomats have been telling us they might be signing on to um, ILO conventions against forced labor, if we would agree that this would not pertain to Xinjiang and the Uyghurs, and that they could continue uh, prosecuting and oppressing Uyghurs as they please. But there are other elements too, like um, oppressive policies against European non-profit organizations established in China, or oppressive media policies where China would be afforded national treatment in the media sector around Europe, while uh, the um, complete control of uh, the Chinese media by the Communist Party should go unchallenged. All of that is unacceptable. So there has been stiff opposition in the European Parliament from the very beginning, and the prospects are not particularly good for the future of that CAI agreement. And of course, in, in addition, since uh, the parliament has been attacked through sanctions, there's a wide uh, agreement among different political that the issue shouldn't even be put on the agenda as long as the sanctions are in force. We will stand fast in the European parliament. And um, you have been standing fast, and uh, we want to team up with you because of that. And we will know, we will, we all know that this is not going to be a sprint, a short sprint. This is going to be a marathon. So we have to have courage and um, also the ability to patiently keep coming back to the same issues over and over again without giving up. I think there are two possible goals for shared political action across Europe beyond always raising the issues again and criticizing them and making everybody understand and working with other countries to also speak up. There are two particular um, concerns that also uh, have an economic impact. And I'm talking about one, a ban on the importation of products of forced labor into European markets, similar to the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act that is being debated in the United States Congress. We should have such a ban. 
We cannot allow European companies to be complicit in uh, the exploitation and the oppression of the Uyghur people in China. And we should also um, ask companies and put public pressure on them if needed to go Xinjiang free in their supply chains uh, as soon as possible. Colleagues, I thank you for the opportunity to talk, to address you, and I hope we will be able to team up even more strongly because this is really a very fundamental battle that teaches us again the basic value of human rights that are one of the pillars on which our own societies have been built. And it also teaches us that patiently and consistently, we also have to address human rights, rights issues wherever they arise in our own countries. Because if we deal with our own shortcomings, we're even more credible in fighting back against the atrocities that we see in China. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bittikoffer, for your contribution to today's discussion, for your presentation on the uh, human rights uh, situation in China. Our next presenter is Mr. Thomas Tugenhardt, who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the um, House of Commons of the United Kingdom and also represents China Research Group. Mr. Tuchenhardt, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for uh, holding this meeting and I'm delighted to participate. Uh, I think Reinhardt spoke extremely well and I'm not going to change anything that he said, uh, but uh, merely to endorse it. What we're seeing is not just a violation of human rights, but a direct assault on the democratic principles that have kept us safe, and particularly here, that you fought for over a hundred years and uh, during your occupation by another totalitarian regime. You need no lessons from me in the value of liberty and human rights, and you need no example from me in the importance of human dignity in the pursuit of good governance. So I won't give you those lessons. What I will say is that this is a moment where we've got to decide. We've got to decide whether we're going to reward those countries that kowtow to Chinese power, whether we stand with those countries who wish to make life easy for themselves for today at the price of tomorrow, and whether or not we are going to decide to live happy for ourselves and mortgage our children's futures? And I would say the answer is clear. When your leaders were keeping your language alive, your culture alive in the dark days of communist oppression, they were thinking of us. And it is our duty in these days when a new form of oppression is rising to think of our children and those who will sit in our seats in our parliaments in the future. So this isn't just about Xinjiang, as Reinhardt quite correctly says. It's not even just about Hong Kong, where many friends of ours in the UK are facing a terrible persecution. It's actually about the kind of world we wish to live in, about the partnerships we wish to have. So whichever view you have taken over Brexit or NATO or any number of different issues that have looked like they might divide us. The key is that those of us who believe in justice, those of us who believe in individual liberty, those of us who believe in the rule of law and free trade, in the rights of free people to assemble and to choose how they assemble, we need to stand together from Japan to Germany to Canada and all free countries around the world. This is a moment when we must decide because we are not looking at a dragon that is unbeatable. We are looking at a dragon that is already weak and already breaking. What we see is a paper tiger, not one made of steel. What we're seeing today, 
like Putin, is proof of weakness, not proof of strength. The reason that she needs to crack down on Xinjiang and Hong Kong and on religious freedoms inside China is not because he is the master, but because he is afraid. He is afraid of his own people. He is afraid of the future they will choose. And he is afraid that he will lose the power and the wealth that he has accrued. When we look at Putin, it's the same. For many of us, Putin is closer, so perhaps the example is easier. What we see him doing to Alexei Navalny does not show us a strong man, it shows us a weak one. It shows us somebody who is afraid of his countrymen. It shows us somebody who has stolen so much of his own nation that he has left the organs of power weakened and enfeebled. It shows us an FSB, an SVR, a GRU, stripped of its integrity and its courage, stripped of its equipment, a failing organization run by thieves, not patriots. And we see sadly too many people, too many of our friends willing to compromise with them. We look at Nord Stream 2, we see the reaction to the events in Ukraine, and too many on our own side a sucking up to a falling man. We need to think hard about how we stand together. Remember why it is that our fathers and grandfathers fought for the freedom we enjoy. And remember that our place is not just to enjoy our lives today, but to make sure that the privileges and freedoms we secured from our parents are passed on to our children. And that's why Reinhardt is right. It's why others are right. It's why I'm standing with you today. Because the freedoms we enjoy are guarded every day by standing up to dictators like Xi and Putin. Thank you. Mr. Tugendhat, thank you so much uh, for your contribution to our discussion. Um, now, I would like to give the floor to our member, our colleague member of the same as Dovila Shakalyana, who is a member of the Committee on National Security and Defense. She's also founder of the Commission for the Prevention of Suicide and Violence. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Colleagues, Lao Gai is a Chinese name for compulsory re-education camps where Uyghurs living in Xinjiang province are mass detained today. For us who escaped the communist camp, the sound of this word suddenly reminds of another word, gulag, a web of forced labor camps designed to re-educate people who are unfavorable to the Soviet regime. Millions of people repressed by the Soviets were imprisoned in the communist camps which were conceived by Lenin and reached the peak during Stalin's rule. A study published uh, by BBC on the 3rd of February 2021 reveals the situation of prisoners in the logai of the Chinese communist regime with systematic beatings, cruel torture and starvation of prisoners. The study also offers facts about daily gang rapes which are even included in the daily routines of some camps. According to the United States Security Department, more than 2 million Uyghurs have been sent to re-education camps. But Logai camps are not the only evil. According to a study published by the Global Publicity Center of the 15th of December 2020, more than 570,000 Uyghurs are exploited in forced labor in cotton fields. In February this year, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute published a report which identified 27 factories in nine regions in China, which exploited the labor of Uyghurs transferred from Xinjiang for education camps. But even imprisonment, torture, rape, and forced labor are not the only measures that the Chinese regime has taken against the Uyghur minority. A study published by the Jamestown Foundation reveals a policy of suppressing birth rates among Uyghurs, including forced long-term contraception and sterilization of Uyghur women. Yes, you have heard me right. Systematic birth rate control for a particular ethnic group. 
According to the study carried out by Dr. Adrian Zen, the birth rate of Uyghurs fell by 84% between 2015 and 2018. A report by New Lines Institute says that the government systematically targets the Uyghurs of reproductive age, the heads of household and community leaders detaining and imprisoning them in unbearable conditions. Uyghur women are subject to childbirth prevention measures. Uyghur children are separated from their parents. Uyghurs are being transferred on mass scale and are forced to work under hard labor schemes in a way that is comparable to mass imprisonment. All these studies show that uh, the systematic persecution of the Uyghur people, including imprisonment, mutilation, killing and sterilization, infringe the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, where Articles 2.2 and 2.4 define genocide as causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group and imprisoning measure, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. On the basis of this international convention adopted immediately after the Holocaust, it can be stated that China has committed the genocide of the Uyghur people today. In January this year, the leadership of the Jewish community in the United Kingdom also spoke about this, saying that as a community, they are always particularly careful in relation to comparisons with the Holocaust. However, stressing the similarities, they added that what allegedly is happening in the People's Republic of China and what happened in Nazi Germany 75, ago, 75 years ago is similar. People are forced to board the trains, the beds of believers of believers are shaved off, women are sterilized, and there is a gloomy ghost of contraception, uh, concentration camps on both sides. As a result of my engagement in defending human rights and my call for an independent international investigation into the Uyghur genocide, on the 22nd of March this year, the denying Chinese regime put me on the list of those who are jabbed to sanctions, a ban on entry to China, Hong Kong, and Macau and a ban on all joint activities with persons, organizations in China, for us and for the institutions associated with us. Moreover, all our family members are automatically subject to sanctions too. It is obvious that, thanks to over a century-long communist rule, this totalitarian regime have, has lost the sense of reality. It fails to realize that repression against parliamentarians and scientists defending democracy and human rights will not frighten the citizens of democratic states, but rather mobilize and unite them. And the very nature and pretext of sanctions is an ideal illustration of the regime's repressiveness. I address the situation of Uyghurs also because the topic is related to two lines of life of Lithuania and that of my own. I have a long-standing experience in the field of human rights protection. CCP keeps repeating that criticism of the Uyghur genocide is merely Western imperialist propaganda, while Laogi does not exist at all. Today, several MPs who were born in deportation are present in the plenary chamber. My mother was born in deportation too. More than 300,000 Lithuanians were imprisoned or deported. Hardly any family in Lithuania has escaped the communist terror. However, just 50 years ago, before the publication of the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, both the Soviets and their defenders in the West denied the existence of the machinery of Gulags and terror. Like the suffering of Uyghurs is being denied today, so was the suffering of our nation. That is why we have the responsibility to speak about this. If we dare to destroy the Red Soviet Communist Empire, let us have the courage to stand up for the people who are persecuted by the communists today. I am proud that the Parliament of Lithuania joined the first parliaments addressing the issue of uh, Uyghur genocide. Similar hearings are taking place in the British Parliament today. The debate has been initiated by the MP Nusrat Ghani, who is also subject to sanctions by the Chinese regime. A resolution on Uyghur genocide will be tabled for voting today. 
Colleagues, while less interested in China, may still have the impression that China is not interfering in the affairs of the other countries. The truth is the opposite. The Chinese regime, on the one hand, encourages openness and invites other technologies to take in Chinese capital and technologies. On the other hand, it strictly restricts the access of foreign business and technology to its market. On the one hand, it demands that the world abide by international legal standards. On the other hand, it constantly ignores them itself. On the international stage, the regime says that other countries should not interfere in China's affairs, and to its citizens, the Chinese Communist Party promotes the ambition of a global power. This hypocrisy is revealed by the following concrete actions. Firstly, the National Security Act has been introduced in Hong Kong, which has actually suspended the Hong Kong's democracy, provoked max protests and riots. Secondly, as regards Taiwan, in January 2019, Xi Jinping said to his generals and security community, we do not promise to give up the use of force and we reserve the option to take all necessary measures. Thirdly, we witnessed the purchase of media outlets by persons and businesses associated with the Chinese regime, even in the EU countries such as the Czech Republic, and the implementation of the policy of censoring negative messages about China. We are also aware of the delay in easing by the EU officials of the report on the disinformation concerning the COVID-19 pandemic under the pressure of China. Under the pressure from China, the officials from the World Health Organization prevented timely provision of information on the threat of the pandemic to countries around the world. However, this can and must be resisted. Lithuania has basically destroyed the 17 plus 1, so it is clear that consistency of position, clear arguments and appropriate strategic partnership may sometimes have more weight than the size of the country. By the way, the Chinese regime says that there is no need to confuse politics and human rights with economic and technological development. But in, its, it, but in its own country, it blocks Western portals and social media platforms, and the idea of, uh, that Western companies could deploy 5G or other strategic technologies in China is absolutely unthinkable. The Chinese regime requests entry, but entry denies. It uh, should... Uh, The uh, regime uh, demands uh, non-interference, but it interferes itself. One might say that a vast and powerful country like China doesn't care about Lithuania. However, China's aggressive reaction shows that it is under international pressure. In fact, the introduction of sanctions against parliamentarians of European countries for defending human rights is an unprecedented and completely inappropriate step. Today it can be seen that just as the occupation of Crimea dispelled even the doubts by the most ardent defenders of Russia and forced the European Union to tighten up its policy towards the Russian regime. It is time to say our strong no to the Uyghur genocide and other human rights violations. It is now that we have a window between the celebration of the centenary of the CCP and the Beijing's Olympics, in which international pressure can bear the most fruit. We cannot continue with business as usual. On your tables, you can see the list of people, Uyghurs, who are missing in the recent days. It is impossible to print uh, 2 million uh, people's list, but you can see a part of them. On the 14th uh, of uh, June, we celebrate the Day of Remembrance, and we read the list of those uh, victims, and you can read those lists of Uyghur people whose fate is unknown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to my colleague Dovilia Shakulienia. Thank you so much. Now I have the pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Christopher Walker, Vice President for Studies and Analysis at the National Endowment for Democracy. Mr. Walker, the floor is yours. Uh, Speaker Victoria Chimite Nielsen and Chairman Gigamontes Pavlionis and other esteemed members of the SEMAS for the opportunity and privilege of presenting testimony on this pivotal topic of the impact of China's global impact on democracy. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize Lithuania's 
remarkable leadership in supporting democracy and human rights more generally, including in Belarus, Russia, and China. For the purposes of this discussion, I'll emphasize three points. The first is that the authorities in China have become more repressive at home and tighten their grip on Chinese societies. Suppressing free expression is central to Beijing's strategy through the use of state-controlled media outlets, digital censorship, the blocking of global news outlets that could offer an alternative independent information source and forms of control drawing on emerging technologies. The Chinese Communist Party maintains an iron grip on the sources of information and content they generate. The authorities in China pursue a relentless attack on civil society. Civil society groups have very limited means to depart from or challenge government narratives. Among the many hindrances placed on civil society is legislation restricting the ability of groups to access international funding and forces foreign NGOs to identify a Chinese sponsor and register with the government. As part of its overall control effort, the Chinese government is engaged in a sweeping project to progressively suppress, synthesize, and even eliminate minority peoples and cultures. In the case of the Uyghur Muslims, the CCP reportedly has built over 260 60 detention centers since 2017, destroyed at least 100 cemeteries, hacked mobile phones, detained unknown numbers of Uyghurs, and implemented forced labor and performed forced sterilizations. The CCP is also working hard to suppress cultural identity in Inner Mongolia. In 2020, the authorities announced that schools in the region must use Chinese as the language of instruction, prompting protests. In subsequent crackdowns, law enforcement arrested or detained thousands, seized property, fired people from jobs, and more. Religious minorities are targets of systematic repression. At least 100 million people face religious persecution, including Protestant Christians, Tibetan Buddhists, Uyghur Muslims, and Falun Gong practitioners. Importantly, the authorities have enhanced their ability to maintain control through the application of modern technologies, what the scholar Samantha Hoffman describes as tech-enhanced authoritarianism. China's surveillance infrastructure includes cameras equipped with facial recognition technology, databases to store information on groups such as dissidents, ethnic and religious minorities, and more, and in-person monitoring of social events. The COVID-19 pandemic led officials to tighten state surveillance. Tech, tech companies developed apps that closely monitor individuals' movement. Furthermore, observers documented at least 897 cases where individuals were arrested for online speech relating to COVID-19 between January and March of 2020. Given the unchecked power wielded by the CCP, these powerful technological innovations are developed without the accountability and transparency that might limit human rights abuses. Second, foreign policy starts at home. As the Chinese authorities have become more assertive internationally, the norms and habits of authoritarian governance have not remained confined within the borders of the PRC. As my colleagues and I note in a soon to be released report on global authoritarian influence, quote, at home the leaderships in Beijing as well as Moscow devote their internal security apparatuses and technological acumen to obstructing or co-opting the activities of civil society and other independent forces as part of an overall control effort. But the suppression of accountability and pluralism that is central to authoritarian systems has spread across national borders and is becoming a powerful obstacle to the global struggle for democracy." End quote. Over time, rather than reforming, China has deepened its authoritarianism and in an era of globalization is now turning it outward. Although China today intersects in many ways with the global system, it has not become more transparent and accountable under the CCP's rule. Rather, it has developed policies and practices that can corrode and undermine democratic standards. This development is visible in a range of international bodies with a mandate to safeguard democracy and human rights standards. Authoritarian powers led by China and Russia are working hard to undercut these entities. They seek to sideline independent groups' participation in the human rights and democracy mechanism of critical organizations like the United Nations 
while otherwise shaping the agenda to marginalize discussion on topics that are deemed unwelcome. This is not simply to defend authoritarianism at home, but to recast the international norms that stigmatize authoritarian governance. Furthermore, the Chinese authorities are exerting forms of influence globally that are at odds with human rights standards in other spheres that include education, media, and through commerce in the form of strategic corruption. But it is in the technological domain where the ground is shifting the most. Technological innovations being forged for social management within China increasingly are being adopted beyond its borders. Many of the techniques that are applied abroad are first incubated at the domestic level by the Chinese authorities. Through the online censorship system known as the Great Firewall, Chinese authorities have long been able to manage and restrict what China's people, the world's largest number of internet users inside a single set of national borders, can access when they go online. Now the government is increasingly applying machine learning to combine censorship and surveillance into comprehensive social management something that will increasingly impact global freedom of expression. Democracies have yet to develop a comprehensive uh, response to China's plan to build digital infrastructure across key parts of the globe, creating what they call a digital silk road and allowing China to immense power over the future of the digital world. For too long, observers in free societies have viewed trends within China as separate from developments beyond the PRC, but this narrow view is misguided and has until now contributed to a dangerous sense of complacency. In an era of globalization, Beijing has internationalized its authoritarian, authoritarianism in ways that affects all of us. The third and final point relates to how the community of democracies must respond. As China's leadership has placed greater importance on shaping the political operating environment overseas, it spent many billions of dollars over the past decade to shape public opinion and perceptions around the world while getting the world to play by the CCP's rules more generally. In order to compete, the democracies will need to address the gap in the sphere of values. And at a fundamental level, any response to this global challenge also needs to consider the essential importance of democratic development within China itself. It's clear now that in this new era of contestation, China has claimed a, global, uh, cl claimed a global larger role on the global stage and has sought to promote its preferred ideas, norms, and approaches to governance. Beijing's unanticipated ability to carry out digital censorship, to use economic leverage to mute voices in the democracies, and more generally to influence democratic systems abroad has created a need for fresh ways of approaching this new situation. As my colleagues uh, and I write in the forthcoming report I alluded to, the, China's, the Chinese regime's divide and conquer methods must be met with democratic unity. A central feature of authoritarian governance at home is divide and conquer approach to exercising power. They do the same at the international level, and to the extent they are successful, the practice places democracies at a strategic disadvantage and weakens their resolve. Therefore, we need to recognize that democracies of all stripes are in this high stake struggle together and must find new and durable ways of cooperating to safeguard values and practices. Civil society can help address persistent, what we'd call political literacy gaps regarding China. We need surge capacity for local civil society expertise that's critical to addressing the corrosive activities of the Chinese party state in established and emerging democracies alike. Civil society broadly understood is a crucial part of democracy's competitive advantage over authoritarian states. And in this, this new environment, a range of actors in the non-governmental sector must develop strategies for resilience that reinforce standards of openness, accountability, and institutional integrity. China under the CCP's control has become an active and purposeful transnational force. The community of democratic states must recognize this new reality and develop a purposeful and resolute response for its defending and affirming of standards of liberal democracy. I'd like to thank you all again for this opportunity. Mr. Walker, thank you so much for uh, being here with us today and for sharing your insights and expertise with us. I would like to give the floor now to um, 
Professor um, Irvin Kotler. Um, let me also uh, present you in Lithuanian. Ponas uh, Kotler. Mr. Kotler is our next speaker. He is uh, chair of the Rural Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and Emeritus Professor of Law, former Minister of Justice, Attorney General, and longtime member of Parliament of Canada. Thank you for uh, the kind words of introduction. May I begin by joining my colleagues in commending the Lithuanian Parliament uh, for their leadership role in the promotion and protection of uh, democracy, generally speaking, be it in Belarus or otherwise, and um, in that context, uh, for holding this timely and significant hearing at a time where Xi Jinping's China is engaged in a multi pronged assault on the rules based international order, on a massive assault on human rights and human dignity, including the targeting of what the CCP has called the five poisons. First, the mass atrocities targeting uh, the Uyghurs, which the US government, uh, the Canadian parliament, the Dutch parliament have said are acts uh, constitutive of genocide and which involve, and reference has been made to it in the witness testimonies, the mass incarceration, close to 2 million Uyghur men, women, and children as young as 13 years of age, the largest incarceration of a minority uh, since the Holocaust, while subjecting them to forced labor, enslavement, torture, disappearances, and even murder. Second, the coercive population controls, including the mass sterilization of women. Third, the forced separation of a half a million Uyghur children from their families. Fourth, state orchestrated incitement to hate and genocide, the characterizing of Uyghurs as, quote, cancerous tumors to be eradicated. And finally, the assault on Uyghur history, heritage, culture, religion, identity, including the desecration of thousands of mosques, all of which have also been documented in our recent report of our Rao Wallenberg Center for Human Rights as acts constitutive of genocide, a report which has been endorsed by over 30 of the leading uh, genocide scholars and international lawyers. But it doesn't end there. The targeting of the five poisons includes also uh, the assault, the frontal assault on the rule of law, the democracy movements, and democracy itself in Hong Kong dramatized by the imposition of the national security legislation and the standing breach of the international Sino-UK treaty. Third, the assault on the Falun Gong, the spiritual and exercise movement, now in the 22nd year of what the CCP has called its program of eradica eradication. Fourth, the repression of Tibetans, and five, the menacing of Taiwan all of these constituting, as I said, the targeting of what the CCP has called the five poisons. But it doesn't regrettably even end there. Uh, what we are witnessing as well is a massive assault and reference has been made uh, on media uh, freedom. It is not as well known as it deserves to be that China jails more journalists than any other country in the world. And indeed it was this suppression of information, this these arrests and disappearances of doctors and dissidents in late 2019 and early 2020, which led to the spread of the COVID-19 international spread of that as a result of this massive domestic repression at home. And we have been witnessing, in addition to that, the targeting in a transnational repression of Uyghurs and Falun Gong and other human rights defenders abroad. And as has been mentioned uh, in a report by the National Committee on Security and Intelligence of the Canadian uh, Parliament, a penetration, a transnational penetration uh, by China that is threatening to our respective security economy human rights, and the like. Accordingly, may I close by sharing with you an action plan 
uh, which the community of democracies can undertake. And for reasons of time, I'll engage in a series of abbreviated one-liners that compose this plan. The first being the need to protect, to undertake our responsibilities to protect the rules-based international order of securing justice for the victims and accountability for the violators. Two, calling on the United Nations to establish an international, impartial, independent, unfettered investigative mechanism to the Xinjiang reason. Number three, to impose targeted human rights Magnitsky sanctions on those involved in the organization planning and implementation of these mass atrocities. And I'm pleased that Canada joined uh, the UK, the US, and the EU recently in imposing such targeted sanctions, the first time that we have done so since the Tiananmen uh, Square massacres. Number four, invoke the responsibility to protect doctrine. Number five, adopt legislation to prevent the importation of produce from slave labor as the US Congress has done. Number six, support and enhance the work of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, which in fact first sounded the alarm on the mass atrocities targeting the Uyghurs, has continued to unmask China's assault on the five poisons. And whereas it's been mentioned, uh, China has sought to sanction parliamentarians from the community of democracies for undertaking their re democratic responsibilities. <laughs> Number seven, we need to establish an intergovernmental alliance on China to parallel the interparliamentary uh, alliance, a concerted alliance of the democracies which will reverse the asymmetrical relationship where China has targeted the democracies one by one, be it Australia, uh, Japan, and Canada, and in that asymmetrical bullying has put all these uh, countries on the defensive. We need to reverse that asymmetrical uh, relationship through concerted action by an intergovernmental alliance re China to parallel the interparliamentary alliance. Number eight, to take up the case and cause of political prisoners such as Ekpar Assad, mentioned by Rehan, who are a looking glass into these mass atrocities. Number nine, to fast track Uyghur refugee applicants. And finally, to protect against the transnational penetration and the concentrated threats, concerted threats to our respective citizenry, security, economies, and the like. And may I close by making one uh, reference to the fact that April is Genocide Prevention Month in the Canadian Parliament. During this month, we remember and uh, commemorate the genocide from the Holocaust to the genocide of the Tutsis, where we are commemorating now the 27th anniversary of the mass murder of 10,000 Tutsis every day for three months, to the more contemporary mass atrocities constituted genocide in Myanmar and now with regard to the Uyghurs. What makes these genocides and what is the emerging lesson from this April Genocide Month so unspeakable are not only the horrors of the genocides themselves. That is bad enough. What makes them so unspeakable is that these genocides were preventable. Nobody could say we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. Just as right now, as we are meeting with the Uyghurs, nobody can say we do not know. We know and we must act. And that is the enduring lesson with respect to these hearings. We know what is happening in the multi-pronged assault on the <clears throat> democratic and rules-based international order. And we must act. Thank you. Mr. Kotlak, thank you so much for your valuable contribution to our discussion here today. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Konstantinos Andriauskas, Associate Professor of Asian Study and International Politics at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science at Vilnius University. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I thank the organizers of this extremely important event and giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts about one of the most 
experiences of the present that overshadows many other devastating recent events that we hear about these days. I did not hesitate to accept this invitation not only because of the importance and relevance of the issue, but also because there are probably not so many people in our small country who have not only studied academically, but also who have visited Hong Kong, Tibet, Taiwan, and especially the so-called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, or East Turkestan. It is the latter that I would like to pay most attention to today, because I would say that it is the clearest point in Beijing's control and oppression. Many of the practices used there are increasingly being relocated, including to Tibet, Hong Kong, and the real China, the mainland China itself. And this is happening at the same time when the Uyghurs, unfortunately, lack a sufficiently strong voice compared to the opposition in other regions, both internally and within the diaspora. And the situation in Xinjiang began to really be of interest to our country much later than, say, in the case of Tibet. I visited Xinjiang over eight years ago, not long after Xi Jinping, who recently became Secretary General of the Communist Party of China, took over the position of the president of the country. Although many of the control, repression and humiliation measures used in Xinjiang today were still difficult to imagine, the region was already clearly different from the real China, not only in its geographical and cultural characteristics, but also because of a clear focus on public security and the actual segregation between the Muslim indigenous peoples, especially Uyghurs and the ethnic Chinese. In addition to the extraordinary hospitality of the Uyghurs, outstanding Islamic and Buddhist cultural heritage objects and exceptional, but also exotically harsh mountain and desert beauty, I remember the surprising similarity of the administrative capital Urumqi of the region to an ordinary city in China. The oil extraction objects that look no less foreign near Turpan and an extremely detailed inspection at the airport before the inner flight to Kashgar and the demolition of buildings in its old town which could be an object for the list of UNESCO's human heritage under different conditions. Today, Xinjiang is the largest province of China in terms of area and one of the five provinces of China's autonomous regions, as if intended to protect the local ethno-linguistic and ethno-confessional diversity. In fact, although the region's formal name includes the Uyghurs, the largest indigenous community, at present, they do not form the absolute majority of the population, having to coexist not only with other Muslim Sunni ethnic groups, primarily related to Turkish-speaking Kazakhs or Kyrgyzaks, but also with a consistently growing Chinese population, which is likely to surpass them in numbers. Despite the official position of Beijing, Xinjiang became part of the Chinese Empire for the first time in the 18th century, which is witnessed, by the way, uh, by its name, New Border, in translation, was not even ethnic Chinese and represented Manjurians. In the socialist era of the People's Republic, the Communist Party initially sought to limit the region's traditional contacts with the neighboring Central and South Asia, and later, in the post-Maoist era of reforms, to use it as a placing to expand its influence to the eight countries directly adjacent to it or beyond. In 2013, the Belt and Road Initiative, personally announced by Xi Jinping, is only the most recent and clearest expression of the recent trend. On the other hand, despite the aforementioned differences in Beijing's policy in Xinjiang, a number of things have remained constant throughout the socialist period, including the intensive use of the region's resources to the real development of China, from relatively isolated areas for nuclear testing to oil extraction, the oppression and control of the traditional local population, and the promotion of ethnic Chinese immigration. 
Honorable members of the Seimas, it may seem to you that Xinjiang is far from Lithuania and therefore perhaps should not interest us so much, but it is actually not so, not the case, especially in this era of economic globalization. Kashgar is closer to Crimea than Beijing, and the Crimean Tatars and Karims are related to the Turkish people of the Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and Kyrgyzstans living in the region. We are separated from Xinjiang mainly by two, but basically only one state. And during the Russian Empire, and especially during the Soviet occupation, we even had a common border, next to which many Lithuanians were imprisoned in the gulags or served in the USSR army against their will. In fact, today, Xinjiang is even closer to Lithuania, but unfortunately, not as we would probably like. Your clothing, including medical masks and smart devices, not only Huawei, but also American Apple and Korean Samsung, can be manufactured using forced labor of Uyghurs and uh, other Muslims in the region. And along with many other Chinese light industry products, it is likely that they have entered our country from Xinjiang to post-Soviet Central Asia and Russia, the so-called New Silk Road. Among the companies involved in the development of the digital gulag of Xinjiang, there are the main sponsors of our football vice champion team and the current national championship leader of Lithuanian Basketball Federation, respectively Hikvision and Huawei. The company Nuktek, that was interested in supplying inspection equipment to our airports. Dahua, which still provides video surveillance equipment uh, for many institutions in our country. It is worth noting that the delicate relationship between Lithuania and Xinjiang is also recognized by the regime in Beijing. The Secretary General of the Communist Party of China, uh, Xi Jinping himself, which we tend to call the country's president, in the documents leaked a year and a half ago, noted the complex interplay between repression and socioeconomic development in the region and in China as a whole, and emphasized that the Baltic countries were among the most developed in the former USSR, but the first ones that left it. In other words, the socioeconomic benefits of such modernization programs in Xinjiang as Western development or New Silk Road should not outweigh the imperative of political control, but rather serve it. In my book currently being written, I show, among other things, that the policy currently being implemented in Xinjiang is a process of several countries in order to physically connect the region to the real China and finally eliminate the differences between them. But Xi Jinping's determination to complete the sad story while he's still in power, this is actually beyond the totalitarian impulses of his own ideological predecessor Mao Zedong. As already been emphasized by my colleagues, today Xinjiang is a tantamount to political space of excessive control and fear in which the totalitarian ambitions are often obscured by George Orwell's vision and the theoretical insight of Michael Foucault and Hannah Arendt. At least one and a half million adult Uyghurs and other Muslims have already passed through the leadership's re-education system, which was thrown as a trammel on a vast region. At the same time, thousands of their children are experiencing similar indoctrination at boarding schools. For minors, by the way, there is a long-standing ban on visiting places of religious cult, mosques, and even giving the names of Arabic origin to newborns. As already mentioned, Xi Jinping's access to Xinjiang can be characterized by the comprehensive gulagalization involving not only ideological indoctrination. I just remember that brainwashing is a metaphor of Chinese origin, but also economic exploitation in the form of forced labor. Unlike its Soviet predecessor, the Chinese gulag is 
ultra modern technological and digital uh, and uh, is not limited to the plants that actually legalized physical slavery and cotton plantations. It is not limited to the infrastructure of free education centers and simple prisons, but also includes all the inhabitants of the region, especially Muslims, whose movements, communication, and everyday habits are monitored with mandatory smartphone apps and a network of millions of video surveillance cameras equipped with advanced facial recognition technology. The Big Brother in Beijing actively collects not only dig digital but also biological Uyghur data in the form of DNA. Finally, the biological oppression of the Chinese regime also includes the fundamental existential function of every human being, reproduction. Every day there is a growing number of testimonies and data, not only about the seemingly organized sexual violence within the re-education system of women, but also the systematic application of extreme, fierce population control measures, including forced irreversible sterilization. In view of all the above measures and their scale, Beijing's ultimate goal seems to be more clear than ever. Under the cover of the fight against extre extremism and separatism, the destruction of Xinjiang Muslims, first of all a large Uyghur community who have no country of their own, is separate ethnic and cultural identity, making them primarily a minor in their own homeland and ultimately Chinese by means of social engineering. Understanding uh, Xinjiang experience is essential to assess the challenges of human rights throughout the vast territory, from the persecution of the Hong Kong democratic movement to the attempts to stop the development of Christianity and to control its practices among the Chinese themselves. Today, Xinjiang is vividly showing us the future of China as a whole and of potentially large part of the rest of the world. Honorable members of the SEMAS and guests, let us do everything in our power to maintain the future dystopia rather than become a reality. We all have to become Uyghurs today, at least for a short while. Thank you. I thank Dr. Konstantinos Andriauskas. I wanted to thank all the presenters, all the speakers for their insights. Contribution for sharing your experience and expertise, protecting human rights promoting democracy and strengthening civil society are crucial values for us. And I would like to, on behalf of Lithuanian Parliament, to thank you once again for your valuable contribution and for sharing your thoughts with us here in this session today. Now let me give the floor to the participants of, uh, di of the discussion and uh, Zygimantas Pavilonis is the first to speak. Tribuna. Uh, well, I know that uh, timing is limited, so I really wanted just to express my gratitude as well as speak it to all friends uh, uh, yeah, that just spoke. We will use uh, your contributions in preparing our own uh, resolution uh, on human rights violations in China. But I have just maybe one question, if uh, you are still with us, uh, Chris uh, from Washington and Reinhardt uh, from Brussels mostly. Uh, we are working uh, together a lot uh, in different areas, especially in Europe, East, in Belarus. Uh, uh, we are working together on, on human rights and democracy in Russia. But we don't have a format where we would together unite uh, uh, on human rights violations and in general policy on China. Lithuania withdrew from 17 plus 1. This was one of those divisive formats. But how can we really create some kind of family, a family of the governments, like Irvin was saying, uh, where we all in EU, uh, across the Atlantic, in UK, you know, global Britain, all together work uh, yeah, in, in confronting this global challenge? And would it be the idea to discuss it in democracy summit in, in Washington, uh, that it seems will be convened? Uh, thank you, so if Chris, uh, and Reinhardt, if you are still with us, uh, I would appreciate your answer. Thank you.
Uh, Mr. Butikofer, do you want to go first? No, I, I let you go first, Chris. Okay, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. So um, I think the question is a critical one. Uh, my, my direct response is that we've made a lot of headway over the last several years in recognizing the scope of the problem. All of the speakers, starting with Raihan Asat, really have put the, um, the seriousness of this challenge into context. And so many uh, open societies, I think, are in a much better position to assess the depth of this challenge right now, uh, but that's not sufficient. I think the, the recognition and the um, admiring of the problem needs to be translated into more um, practical action. Some of the parliamentary initiatives, I think, are a really fantastic start, but has been, has been suggested, I think it needs to go beyond that. I think what I would stress is that there needs to be both um, a governmental dimension to this. Uh, it's inescapable that that needs to be a part of the equation. But I would really stress, especially given the work that uh, the National Endowment for Democracy does around the world, that we also need a meaningful and durable uh, civil society component to this because the sort of questions that are arising that themselves are, are, are changing on a daily basis, the methods of um, censorship, the methods of manipulating free expression, these don't always lend themselves to governmental responses, certainly not in free societies, to regulation or to laws. It's really about the norms and standards that are defended by editors at newspapers and media enterprises by deans and leaders at universities who today are facing pressures from um, either uh, needs to be uh, connected to China because they feel there's money to be made or because prestige comes with that. But that shouldn't require a sacrificing of basic democratic values of academic freedom and free expression. Just to use those examples, and we could talk about Hollywood and the entertainment industry as well, but I think it's really critical that we start to build the sort of networks and practical mechanisms, both on the non-governmental side, but also on the governmental side. And certainly the, um, a meeting like the one that's to be convened at some point in the foreseeable future under the rubric of the Summit for Democracy couldn't take on board this, uh, this important issue. If you allow me, President, to follow up on that, I would um, start by fully endorsing uh, Christopher's statement that this has to be an all of society uh, effort. We are being challenged at the moment by China in a way that we have not seen since the heyday of the Cold War. And uh, I would say that the meeting between uh, Yang Tiechu and Wang Yi on one side and uh, Jake Sullivan and Secretary Blinken on the other in Anchorage and the anti-EU sanctions um, mark a new face in that challenge because this gives expression to a very deep-seated sense of invincibility in the assumption that there will be an inexorable rise of this totalitarian regime, or as the PRC propaganda says it, that the east wind will grow stronger and the west wind will get weaker. And um, just to resent that and to oppose that will certainly not be enough. Uh, we have to look at the underlying dynamics and they are not all in our favor. And I believe that we have a great opportunity uh, to uh, persist and prevail because of the resilience of democratic societies. Uh, their 
creative potential. Uh, I think uh, that China is uh, vastly underestimating that. Uh, societies are always slow in uh, getting their act together and uh, picking up a, a fundamental challenge. But once they set their minds, they can be very effective. And I think that's what uh, we have experienced and you have experienced in so many uh, ways. It will not be enough to just build an anti-totalitarian, anti-authoritarian or anti-China front. What we have to do is we have to devise our own positive trajectory to describe our own better perspective. And I think there is no better slogan around at the moment than the slogan championed by President Biden, who said, let's build back better. We have to build back. We have to acknowledge uh, our weaknesses and our failings, but we will not just return to the status quo uh, before. We will do that better. And I think we are fully capable of doing that. And uh, we have to find uh, new ways also in aligning with uh, democratic nations. Dem democracies must have each other's backs. And we cannot allow countries to be singled out for criticism and coercion by China as they're doing with Australia or Canada, or as they did with the Czech Republic or with Sweden. Uh, so uh, I believe uh, we have to be open our arms to um, invite partners from around the globe, not just the OECD democracies, also partners in the global south. We see how countries like India or countries in the ASEAN region are now opening up more towards Europe because they see Europe as a valuable partner for their own endeavors to defend their freedoms and their own um, international rights to be, um, to be a player and not just uh, the, the grass on which an elephant would trample. Uh, so I believe that if we align across the pond, across the Atlantic, but also with other like-minded countries, we will be of um, mastering this challenge. Thank you for your answers. Uh, I would like to thank our presenters and um, participants of the discussion for their presentations and remarks. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. Manuelis Zingeris, but I want to remind that our discussion is approaching the end. Uh, Mr. Butikofer, dear um, representative from the Uyghur community, thank you for being with us together. Uh, seeing you together with us, I try to recall the history of my mother, who is 99, and she spent four years in the camp seeing children being uh, uh, taken to the gas chamber because uh, they had a different uh, appearance. Today we spoke about the fact that racial features of uh, Uyghurs are being uh, recorded in computer programs. It reminds us uh, the Second World War and the genocide according to the facial features. Uh, can we imagine what uh, uh, it means to be Uyghur in China? Two million people in the camps. I would like to thank Bavilia for her courage. All what you do
is uh, following the democratic path because democracy has to be first. Madam Speaker of the Seimas, we have the points proposed by Mr. Kortler. We can enter them in our resolution and to recommend them to other national parliaments in the European Union. And to Mr. Butikov, um, I would like to say that uh, considerations on the deal with, the, with China should be uh, measured, uh, carefully measured, uh, to see whether we really need this deal. We also have to broaden the understanding what the assault on a country is. Uh, is it uh, January 11? Or, for example, interference in our democratic elections? Isn't it an assault on our country? I remember when uh, we had a meeting of uh, um, the Crimean parliament in exile and all the powers were switch all the power was switched off it was a black complete blackout it wasn't that an assault therefore the concept of NATO on Article 5 should be revised. With the participation of our partners, it should be pertvarkyta organizacija organization that reagoja į užpolimus, totalitarinių režimų užpolimus. Aš labai Dėkuoju tiems, kurie parlamentariams, kurie prisijungia. To the totalitarian regimes, I thank uh, all uh, our friends and colleagues. I thank uh, Lithuanian uh, uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Zhubalis. Uh, the, the community of democracies needs to be restructured. We are happy that Mr. Biden said that solidarity should go first, democracy should go first, and not only America first. We have to defend the slogan by military measures as well. Thank you very much. I thank uh, Mr. Zingeris for your insights and your remarks. I thank the participants of this discussion, and now we uh, resume with our evening uh, sitting of the same as. Teimo nutarimo dėl valstybinės kultūros paveldo komisijos narių atleidimo ir skirimo projektas pranešėjas Vytautas Jozapaitis, o pirmininkauti kviečiu pavaduotoje Radvilė Markūnaitė Mikulėninė.